Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the tendencies of modern civilization that Fyodor Dostoevsky is criticizing through the mouth of his interlocutor in Notes of the Underground is represented by the image of the Crystal Palace. And there actually was a Crystal Palace that Dostoevsky himself did in fact get to see that somebody had built at that time. The idea behind the Crystal Palace is that it's a, it's a perfect work true transparency, model of engineering and physics, something that would emblemize or uh, symbolize what it is that, that human beings could do and transform themselves as individuals and as members of society into a purely harmonious system in which everything would have its place Everything would be balanced, ordered, proper. And Dostoevsky has his character say, I, I don't actually want a crystal palace like that. And I think a lot of other people don't, including some of the people who are its greatest advocates. And so let's take a look at the mindset, this dream, we could say, of the rationalists, the humanitarians, the social reformers, and indeed of the entire Enlightenment project. So he talks about the problem. You know, why do people do all the stupid things that they do? Why is society so badly organized? We're always at counter purposes with each other. You can think about this just in terms of like traffic, you know, driving on the highway or negotiating your, your path through the elevator or anything like that in a crowded building. Why do people do the things that they do? You know, why, why does this person like drive slow in the fast lane causing, uh, you know, everybody else to have to go around them? Don't they understand that they're, you know, screwing up the system? And so, the idea behind these reformers is whatever aspect of life it happens to be, we can, we can show people where their true interests and advantages lie. And if, and if we do that, they're no longer going to behave in the ways that they do. You know, we would, we would actually help them, he says. You know, man does nasty things just because they don't know where their real interests lie. If they were enlightened about it, they would immediately stop acting like pigs and be kind and noble. Being enlightened, they would see where their advantage lay and that it lay in acting virtuously. And, you know, there's lots of different projects and you know, schemes for how to do this. As a matter of fact, you could say that one of the key aspects of the Enlightenment as a cultural movement is the generation of idea after idea after idea, system after system of here, here's what the ideal situation is going to look like and how we're going to get there, what the blueprint is. And so he talks about, you know, what we would do. And, and he says that science, common sense, humanitarianism, all these things can actually rework us human beings. And he, he says that um, there's no doubt in your mind that human beings will learn as soon as they've gotten rid of certain old bad habits when common sense and science have completely re-educated human nature and directed along the proper channels. You, he's addressing the utopians, seem certain that man himself will give up airing of his free will and will stop opposing his will to his interests. You say that science itself will teach man, that he has neither will nor whim, never had, as a matter of fact, that he's something like a piano key or an organ stop, that there are, on the other hand, natural laws in the universe 
Whatever happens to him happens outside of his will, as it were, by itself in accordance with the laws of nature. So then all we need to do is discover those laws and man will no longer be responsible for his acts. Life will be really easy for him then. All human acts will be listed in something like logarithm tables, say up to the number uh, 108,000 and transferred into a timetable. Or better still, catalogs will appear designed to help us in the way our dictionaries and encyclopedias do. They will carry detailed calculations and exact forecasts of everything to come so that no adventure and no action will remain possible in the world. What is he talking about there? Well, we're going to examine the human being and totally make sense out of them. We're going to use science. We're going to use, you know, our, our ways of uh, categorizing. So you know, sort of logic applied. We're going to in, in, look at their practical action and reasoning, and we're going to fix it all. This is still a, a, a dream today. As a matter of fact, the people who are big proponents of technology uh, seem to think that you can take technology and apply it directly to the human condition and we can, you know, make things so much better. As a matter of fact, it's become kind of a silly trope within the tech industry, uh, you know, that, that we're making the world a better place with this algorithm by, you know, nudging people in this way or that way based on neuroscience, right? Most of the stuff that, that purports itself to be neuro anything out there is just kind of a pasteboard uh, cobbled together things with all sorts of hat, ad hoc assumptions that uh, may not actually hold up. There is some, some real neuroscience going on, but that often doesn't make such great fanfares. It's almost as if, there's a little bit of a digression here, it's almost as if human beings need to talk themselves into thinking that these utopian schemes aren't actually BS and will hold up to real scrutiny while making sure that never, uh, there never really is any real scrutiny applied to them. Now, coming back to Dostoevsky, what would we do? We would, we would change things in such a way that people would stop desiring the wrong things. We would inform them. We would reshape them. We would guide their desires and their formation and their habits and take away the old wrong-headed associations. And over time, we would create a much better society in which everybody could flourish, we could say, as it were. Um, there might even be room, he says, for, you know, chaos, swearing, and all of that sort of stuff. Maybe there could be a calculation for that. So, or a calculation would prevent it. So that sanity would prevail. And we could have everybody, you know, getting exactly what's good for them in, in that respect, right? Now, what if that were to, to happen? Dostoevsky doesn't actually think that you're going to manage to pull this off. But let's just say it did. Let's say that you had all of these resources and you started changing human beings and you managed to change human nature. He says, well, when desire merges with reason, then we will reason instead of desiring. Um, all our desires and all of our reasoning, once they can be computed, for the day is bound to come and we'll understand what governs what we now describe as our free will, then we may really have some sort of tables to guide our desires like everything else. So if a man sticks his tongue out at someone, it's because he cannot not stick his tongue out at that person and he has to hold his angle at exactly that, has head at that angle. So we would stop actually desiring in, in the way that we feel ourselves to desire and we would just follow sort of the laws of nature, very complicated laws, you know, what we might call psychological or sociological laws, these generalizations, you know, as we get to know more about the brain and more about human interaction, we could come up with this incredibly complex system that we could perhaps put into a predictive AI. And then it would, we wouldn't even need really to, to do all those things. The AI could model it for us, right? The result is that we'd have no freedom, no freedom in any real sense. We'd keep doing the same things that we do, but we wouldn't be doing them as free beings. What effect would that have? Dostoevsky says that would leave no room for what it is that humans really want, 
what elsewhere he's called the most advantageous advantage, which is to desire, decide for oneself and desire for oneself and to, to will and have whims and, and to express one's own individuality, even if that individuality kind of sucks. All of that would be left out of this, would be excluded. There'd be no room for it. And he, he goes on and he says, well, that would be a very boring existence. You know, um, this would not be a, a, a fun way to live. This would be dull. And, you know, there's a secondary problem there. Well, what happens when people get bored? Well, they do stupid things. Well, we'd somehow exclude that with these arrangements and algorithms and orderings and tables and charts. So they wouldn't even be allowed to be bored. Now, there's another thing that Dostoevsky has to say about this that's really quite interesting. And we have to pull some of the consequences out. We have to read between the lines on this. He says, So far, these are nothing but assumptions on your part. I'll grant you they conform to the laws of logic, but are they in accordance to the human law? In case you think I'm crazy, let me explain. I agree that man is a creative animal doomed to strive consciously towards a goal, engaged in full-time engineering, as it were. So he's saying we are teleologically driven. So, you know, we can, in fact, have our interests and advantages explained to us. Somebody can say, oh, well, you want to learn how to play guitar? Maybe the best way to do it for you is not actually watching videos on the Internet. Uh, maybe you need to take some guitar lessons with somebody or you know, get yourself a book or do this or do that, right? We, we have a teleological explanation. Then we can say, well, why do you want to learn guitar? Well, I want to learn to shred, man. Oh, okay, if that's what you had in mind, well, then you don't necessarily need to learn this stuff. You need to learn this stuff instead. I want to play, uh, you know, flamenco music. Oh, well, then you're going to have to do a lot of finger exercises. And this would be helpful for you, right? We can do that sort of thing. Oh, I want to play in a band. Oh, well, then you probably need to actually start talking with other people who might someday want to play with you and start learning how to jam rather than perform simply on your own, right? We can go on and on and on. Dostoevsky goes further with this. He says, we are engaged in full-time engineering, busy building ourselves roads that lead somewhere, never mind where. Perhaps if he feels like straying now and then, it is just because he's doomed to build this road that the road goes somewhere, and the main thing is not where it goes, but keeping the well-meaning babe at his engineering chores, saving him from the deadly snares of idleness. We like creating and building roads. Why, why then do we like chaos and disorder and destruction? He says, well, perhaps it's because we're instinctively afraid of reaching the goal that we are working for. How do you know? Perhaps that he likes his objective only from a distance. Perhaps he only likes to contemplate it and not to live in it, preferring to leave it when it comes down to it to animals such as ants, sheep, and such, right? Ants are different. They have their, their anthill and they follow their programming and they do it real nice. And, you know, it's amazing what they can do. But we're not ants. We're not simply programmed uh, devices or animals. He says, the purpose is life itself and not the goal, which of course must be nothing but two plus two equals four. So he loves the achieving, he says, but does not particularly enjoy what he achieves. Isn't that funny? Well, human beings are comical animals. Now, let's think about that. So we'd be more interested in the doing than the goal itself, and we'd be driven by our desires in ways that are sometimes irrational. Could you apply that to the goal of the Enlightenment? Maybe even the people that are for the Enlightenment, when they start getting closer to it, and they start seeing their dream becoming a reality, aren't quite so happy with what they're seeing and start finding ways to drag their heels and dither around and not make the progress that they want to make or get themselves in stupid personality conflicts or find other ways to you know, break the crystal palace and send it tumbling down so they can rebuild it again. Maybe that's what really lies behind this dream of the rationalist. Because think about it, if it was actually achieved, we would lose an integral part of human nature. We would lose our freedom 
we would, we would become bored with that and we wouldn't even be allowed to express our boredom by breaking things or making punk music or something like that, right? Uh, listening, you know, doing the, the thing, putting the guitar too close to the amp and playing around with the feedback. No, no, you mustn't do that sort of thing. There's either, either it would work, which is a possibility for us, and that's going to be a bad possibility, or this whole thing is really more irrational than it pretends itself to be. So those are Dostoevsky's reflections on this desire to turn the human being into something like a set of organ stops or a set of algorithms, something that can be predicted, something that can be measured, something that can be improved upon indefinitely until we reach the limit point of perfect humanity. Dostoevsky is saying that is a project that's doomed to fail by its own nature. And the more that it doesn't fail, the worse off we actually are. 